So the next talk is by uh, Clement uh, Pitt Clodel, Peng Wang, Benjamin Delaware, Jason Gross, and Adam Chipola, Extensible Extraction of Efficient Imperative Programs with Foreign Functions, Managed, uh, Manually Managed Memory and Proofs. And for this, uh, I'm supposed to uh, play, uh, play a video. So let me see if I can, I can pull that off. Hi, everyone, and thanks for tuning in. My name is Clement. I'm a grad student at MIT working with my advisor, Adam Chipala, and many colleagues, including my co-authors, Barry, Jason, and Ben, to make it easier to build robust software. Let me start with a high level pitch before I dive into the details of this work. For a while now, our lab has been on a quest to build end-to-end -end verified systems. In our ideal world, the process of writing a program would work roughly like this. First, you start with high level specifications, that is mathematical descriptions of the behaviors you expect from your program. Then you feed these into a domain specific compiler tailored to your problem domain, which automatically derives an efficient implementation of your specification. Optionally, you add a few more optimization hints into the mix to get even better code. And you're done, ready to enjoy automatically derived implementations that are both certified correct and fast. We're not quite there yet, but we've been building up to it. The key insight is that a wide variety of tasks can be described in crisp and simple terms as combinations of high-level operations that omit all implementation details. This allows you to think of your problems not in terms of algorithms on the one end and data structures on the other hand, but in terms of functionality on the one end and performance on the other hand. This talk is about the last piece of the puzzle, from high-level specifications to correct by construction, low-level, efficient implementations. I assume I'm preaching to the choir here, but let's recap briefly what we stand to gain should such a vision materialize. First, we get fewer logic bugs. We get specifications written in a clear and concise language that is straightforward to audit and to compare to requirements. And we know that we can trust the final code and trust that it matches the specification because the compilation process produces proofs that connect the implementation back to the specs. So we don't need to debug the programs that we actually run. We just need to make sure that our specifications correctly capture our original design intent. Second, we get improved security and reliability. Our proofs guarantee that optimizations cannot introduce unexpected behaviors, at least in terms of functionality. And since there's no notion of ad-bound rights, privilege escalation, etc. in our language of specifications, there can be no such things in the resulting program. Third, we get improved maintainability. Because we separate functionality and performance constraints, we have much lower risks of finding ourselves stuck with complex hand-tuned code that's hard to update when requirements change. Conversely, since the final implementation is obtained by combining specs and performance hints, we can just tweak the hints if the input or the platforms we run on have different performance characteristics without worrying about jeopardizing correctness. Finally, with enough optimization hints, we can hope for better performance. Instead of relying on experts to tune individual programs, we can embed the experts' knowledge into our domain-specific compilers and make their insights reusable. Usually, this is the point where people start rolling their eyes in disbelief, and objections tend to fall into two camps. On the one side, we have people who conclude that we're just building another overhyped compiler for a functional programming language with lofty promises and probably middling performance. On the other hand, we have people who think that there's just no way this can be made to work. In general, we actually agree. There's no way this will work in general. The convenient trick is, it doesn't have to work for all programs. It just has to work for a large enough set of programs. It turns out that there are many domains in which programmers are already quite used to thinking in terms of high-level DSLs that separate functionality on the one hand and performance on the other hand. That's exactly what we already do, for example, when we write SQL queries and then separately describe how the data should be manipulated by creating database indices. It's also what we already do when we use combinators or grammars to write parsers instead of implementing a particular parsing algorithm by hand. And these examples are everywhere. Most command line applications expose little languages that allow users to specify what should be done without saying precisely how it should be done. The problem with many of these is that in most cases, the thing that turns your commands or your specifications into actual results only offer very limited opportunities for performance tweaking. There might be a few flags here and there, but opening the hood of the compiler is scary, complex, and not something regular users are expected to do. Our pitch is that with the right design, we can open up compilers in a way that let users teach the compiler the right optimization tricks to turn these specs into high-performance compiled code without sacrificing readability nor correctness. This means, in turn, that we can enable new uses. For example, with the right compiler, you could embed the results of compiling SQL queries directly into low-level bare machine code, like an OS kernel. Okay, so how do we do this? Well, the usual approach to get verified code in Coq 
is to start with an informal specification, translate this to Galena, prove some properties about the result, use a process called extraction to obtain OCaml code, and then use the OCaml compiler to obtain binaries. It works well, but there are weak points. The specifications are often written as functional programs, so there's a bit of a gap between the informal spec and the formal spec. Then there's your Koch implementation, which is constrained by what the Koch language supports, which means no mutation, no manual memory management. Then there's the extraction process, which is verified on paper, but doesn't actually have a computer verified proof. And finally, there's the OCaml compiler, which isn't verified either, and which is a lovely piece of engineering that produces pretty darn good code but often still falls short of what you might have written by hand in a lower level language if you had the time, the resources, and the skills to actually write the code by hand without riddling it with bugs. Then there's the approach that we're pushing. We phrase our specs in the non-determinism monad to allow you more flexibility when writing your specifications, meaning that you can be closer to your original problem description. Then we use automated refinement to derive correct by construction functional programs. Then we use a new extraction technique that produces proofs along the extracted code so that we don't have to trust this part. And then we use a verified compiler that supports separate compilation to go down to assembly, a language, a version of assembly called Bedrock. And when we get there, we link against handwritten and hand-verified assembly data structure libraries. And all this time, we never leave the comfortable confines of the Cockproof Assistant. This paper and this talk is on the middle part of this pipeline, our last missing piece. Starting from high-level specifications, we refine down to functional programs using a framework called FIAT that we wrote a while ago. Then we connect to a new imperative language called Facade using a process of proof-producing extraction that is the core of the stock. And finally, we compile down to Bedrock, linking with verified libraries once we get to the bottom. Great, so now let's get to the technical stuff. When you write a program in Galena, the language inside of Cock, you get great reasoning facilities, but the performance is not the best. For example, Galena is a pure language, so you don't have to reason about mutation. But as a result, well, you can't directly use mutable data structures, arrays, and generally you end up doing a lot of pointer chasing in your final implementation. Second, the natural way to write programs in Galena tends to cause a bunch of allocations, so you spend a lot of time in garbage collection. Garbage collection isn't so bad when it's needed, but often it's better to just not generate the garbage in the first place. Third, the languages that Galena extract don't give you extract to don't give you very precise control over inlining, specialization of higher order functions, and representation of values, so you often end up paying a lot in terms of closures and boxing. Let's look at an example. I want to increment all numbers in a list by a constant n. Cog makes it really convenient to think about linked lists, so this is how I'll write the program. But maybe my data would fit nicely into an array, for example, so that's the code I'd like to get as the output of my compiler. Well, we all know that the length of the assembly that the compiler produces is not a perfect metric for the efficiency of the code, but let me just say that the OCaml version on the left isn't going to win this fight. In fact, the typical list.map is not tail recursive, so the default implementation is going to blow the stack. The tail recursive implementation builds the list in reverse and then needs to build a second list just to put it back in proper order, generating heaps of garbage. Inlining is hard to predict, but thankfully with proper annotations, they can work around that here. And in any case, the worst part is that map allocates a whole new linked list, even if the old one is not going to be reused anymore. So what we're doing is we're wasting a perfectly good bunch of storage that could have been recycled to hold the new values after mapping through the list. The problem here is that as a programmer, I have to know roughly what low level code I want to get, but I can't be trusted to write it correctly. And I can't afford the time to write it, test it, and debug it. High level languages do make me more productive, but they also cost me in terms of performance. I could try to teach my compiler how to better compile my code, but it's quite tricky. How do you tell your compiler this list should be implemented as an array without rewriting all your code to use actual arrays? How do you say this error monad should be implemented with a go-to jumping straight into a, an error handler without allocating and destructing options? Many compilers do have extension points, but at best, these are rewritings in a single language. And more commonly, there are annotations on the code or hacks like using opt-up-magic in the right places, writing code in an unsafe subset of the language, and so on and so forth. The solution we offer to this problem is to ditch the idea of having just one canonical compiler. Instead, we have one small compiler per domain. We design the compiler so that it's easy to teach it new tricks without breaking its correctness and variance. In the example above, we'd like to teach it to recognize the case where the list isn't reused and to recycle its storage in place. We also teach it to not use a list at all and to put the data in an array instead. 
for example. One of the cool tricks is that even if we phrase it as an optimization, it's not really a rewrite in a single AST as these things are usually done, because what's happening in the output isn't really expressible at all in the input. The source is a pure functional programming language with a garbage collection, and the output is an imperative program with state and explicit memory management. Concretely, the way this works is that we do a very weak form of program synthesis driven by the shape of the input program. We're in the context of a proof assistant, so we state a theorem that says that there exists a low-level program which, given the right arguments, produces the same output as our original functional program. We do the proofs using tactics and individual lemmas that handle specific constructs like maps, arithmetic, and so on. And since the existence proof is done in the setting of constructive logic, it carries a compiled program as a witness that we can retrieve after the proof is complete. Often, to prove the properties of an imperative program, you symbolically execute it step by step to confirm that its results obey a given post condition. I like to think of what we do as the reverse. We start with a post condition, and then we symbolically rewind it to construct a program that will produce the results compatible with this post condition. Each compiler targeting a new domain is assembled from three kinds of lemmas. First, there are basic syntax lemmas, which handle common forms that appear in all sorts of domains. These are the common plumbing shared by all our domain specific compilers arithmetic, ifs, and so on. Second, custom rewriting lemmas, which transform code expressible in Gedolina into more efficient code still expressible in Gedolina. These fit well in Haskell's rewriting style. Last, there is cross language lemmas, which let you replace bits of Gedolina with efficient bits of facade code, our target language. These are the interesting ones because they allow you to introduce things that you couldn't directly express in Galena. Because each lemma is independent and proven correct, users can safely introduce new lemmas into the mix. In the worst case, they'll get suboptimal code, or more likely, the compiler will get to a code pattern that it doesn't know how to handle, and it will just complain loudly. User supplied extensions usually contain three parts new lemmas to support new data structures and new transformations, new tactics to decide when these lemmas are pertinent to apply and new decision procedures, which confirm that the conditions under which these lemmas are applicable do hold. And that's important because transformations like the list reuse I mentioned earlier are not valid in all the circumstances. In the case of the list, we have to make sure that it would actually never be uh, read from again. But fortunately, unlike a compiler where the heuristics are fixed and tricky to extend, our users can plug in arbitrary reasoning facilities. So if an optimization is valid, our users can always guide the compiler towards applying it. Here are a few examples of transformations that should help convince you that using one single compiler can't work. For reasoning about sequences, cock lists are great, but the optimal implementation can take very diverse forms. For example, maybe I have a list of keys and values and I want a mutable hash table, or maybe I have a list of bits and I want to represent them as an array of bytes, or I have a list of commits and source control and I do want a linked list in the generated code, or I have optional records that fit well within 63 bits and so I want to use the last bit of my machine words to indicate whether I'm in the sum or the non case without any boxing. Purely functional data structures are not enough. So we let users specify which types each value should map to in the low level language. All right, now that you've had a rough idea of the problem, compilers are not extensible enough, and our solution, a customizable form of syntax driven synthesis and a proof assistant, let's dive into the details. <coughs> What you see on the screen is a whore triple. On the left is the precondition, which says that a variable named arg holds a value a. The meaning of holding a value depends on how the user chose to represent this particular value in memory, which is abstracted by the um, maps to arrow on this slide. On the right is the post condition, which states that the variable name output should contain the result of running function f on value a. In the middle is prog, the unknown program that we're hoping to infer. Since prog can't depend on a, the relation will hold for all values of a, and prog will indeed be a correct implementation. The language that f is allowed to use is a combination of subsets of Galena used to encode DSLs, enhanced with a non-terminism of net, to allow embedding arbitrary propositions, which we use for modeling data structures. In particular, we use them for modeling data structures without canonical representations, which might have multiple different representations that we encompass together um, under a single umbrella. The F is shallow embedded. We don't have its AST. Prog, on the other hand, is a deep embedded term, the syntax tree of a facade program. Facade is a simple language that we wrote, along with a verified compiler, to enforce some linearity constraints that simplify reasoning about memory. 
To compile the program, a user has to supply a source program with potentially non-deterministic bits. Instances of a wrapper type class that specifies which low-level data types to map source types to, and description of how the compile function will receive its arguments. And finally, a description of how the function will return its results. After compilation, we produce a facade module, which includes an AST and a list of external functions with their interface, which we'll have to link against at a later point to get a closed program. Let's look together as an example of how we can do code generation using a proof search. We'll take a hypothetical program that looks at an unspecified element of a list and returns that if it's lower than seven and seven otherwise. This any of is an underspecified operation in the non-determinism monad, so implementations of it are allowed to return any value that the list contains. The input-output spec of this program will be that it takes some representation of the input data, though quite possibly not as a linked list, and returns the input data unchanged, as well as the result of the computation that we care about, stored in the variable out. Two things to note. First, though the original program used the list, the final program doesn't need to. In fact, here, we'll use a tree structure presumably because it would make sense given the rest of the application, which is not shown here. Second, although the spec says that the L variable isn't changed, it's only really the model of it that shouldn't change. If the actual implementation wants to reorganize itself under the hood, as long as it behaves the same, that's quite permissible. So now we have this one unknown in the middle, the two question marks, and we'll derive what to fill them with. Looking at the output, the first thing we want to do is to split our derivation task into two. First, We'll compile the any of part, then we'll compile the if. Here, I'm assuming that our tree structure has a peak operation, and that we proved that peak does in fact return an element that's in the tree. I'm skipping over issues with the list being empty, by the way, which we'll assume was separately ruled out. So we apply this lemma that says that bag.peak returns an element of the data set, and by unification, we infer that the question mark one part can be implemented using peak. Now the second part, which I'll abbreviate for succinctness, though we discussed this abbreviation operation quite a bit in the paper, where we in fact call it chomp because it eats the same prefix from both sides. Here are the L and the R. We have an if as the head of our output term, so we can apply the if compilation lemma provided by the library, and that says roughly this. If I know how to compile a condition, a left branch when the condition holds, and a right branch when the condition doesn't hold, then I know how to compile the whole if by combining these three subprograms together. I now get three new goals, which I can handle using three new lemmas, one for integer comparisons, one for copying local variables, and one for constant assignments. Under the hood, the cockproof assistant has been keeping track of all these lemmas that I'm applying and progressively assembling the existential witness for the theorem that I'm proving. And indeed, when I get to the end, I can print the whole program, which says, as you might expect, it calls peak, branches on the value returned, and assigns a result. Here's another example, which I won't go through in as much detail, but it's useful to illustrate a few more tricks. It follows the same template of the previous one for clarity, but here we pop an element from a list and then we return that value if it's even and none if it's odd. Three interesting things happen. First, the spec of pop is like that of any of in the sense that it allows us to return any value from the list. In turn, this means that we can use a facade function whose specification doesn't say which value it might return. This is particularly useful when the low-level data structure doesn't have a canonical representation for example, because it might reorganize itself. Expressing this in Galena would have been possible, but to get to sufficiently deterministic levels, that is to construct a fully deterministic model of the level function in Galena, we'd have to encode all the details of its, inter its internal layout. With our approach, we're able to prove a refinement instead and replace the underspecified pop with the low-level implementation while extraction is happening. Second, the test for odd which in Galena was implemented as a recursive function over natural numbers, got transformed to an efficient bitwise operation. Expressing this in Galena would have been feasible, but even if the Galena code talked about bitwise operations, we'd still have wanted to map these to low-level primitives. We don't want to compile a bitwise AND as a recursive function over two natural numbers. Third, the original code mentions an option, but assume that we know from context that the values in that option are bounded and don't require all 64 bits of a machine word. Then we can dedicate one bit to tracking whether value is sum or none without introducing a level of boxing or explicit tags for constructors. I hope that by now you have a pretty clear picture of the insight that allows us to extract these programs from Galena to an imperative language and prove the result correct. To convince ourselves that this worked, we built a bunch of small examples and applied custom assembled compilers to derive implementations. Here's an input output example. 
where we translate the reverse map into a loop that reverses one stack into another stack. We wrote dozens of these, and in addition to this one, I'll highlight just one more to show you how we concretely implement extensions when we want to teach the compiler about new patterns. In this snippet, I have defined a function nibble power of two, which checks, given a word x, whether that word plus one is one, two, four, or eight. The Galena implementation is using four nested ifs. If I don't tell the compiler anything, it will dutifully stop when it reaches that point and ask me how to compile this new function that I just introduced. So here, I'll just tell it to unfold it and compile its body. And surprisingly, we'll get four nested ifs. Alternatively, I can tell the compiler to replace this new function with a call to an external function, here labeled intrinsics.nibblepow2. After running the compiler, I get a much shorter piece of code, which I'd expect just calls an external function. I can write it by hand in a separate language, and then I can use our verified linking facilities to connect that implementation to this program. The paper and our code supplement have all sorts of examples of extensions like this, including adding new data structures, new kinds of loops, new primitives, and so on. You'll remember from the beginning of the talk, though, that our motivation for building this component was to create an end-to-end -end verified pipeline. So we made the following case study. We specified a very simple model of a process scheduler, which is a program that tracks running and suspended processes. We wrote the specs in terms of database queries. It's a natural way to think about the operations, like adding or counting processes, though people typically write those by hand in low-level languages for efficiency. We also hand-implemented verified binary trees directly in Bedrock Assembly, and we extended the compiler to teach us how to use these trees to implement the bag abstractions that our pre-existing query structures refinement framework employs. So here's the spec of our idealized scheduler. You can spawn a new thread, enumerate running processes, or query the scheduler about a particular process. We start by running Fiat, an automated refinement framework from previous work, which gives us results in terms of abstract bag operations like find, insert, and so on. Then we apply to each of these a similar compilation strategy as the one I described previously in the stock. For concreteness, here's the generated code for one of these. To get this all to work, we had to first enrich facade's ADT type to represent database tuples and indexed collections of these tuples. This allowed us to specify these operations on the basic types that the assembly implementation had to specify. Second, we had to pick low-level representations for input and output values and construct pre- and post conditions to drive the extraction of each method by translating fiat method signatures into whore triples. Third, we had to write new lemmas to teach the compiler how to manipulate the newly written data structures. And finally, we had to combine the extraction proofs with the refinement proofs and the compiler proofs to obtain an end-to-end -end theorem. The total effort for extending the compiler to support query operations is roughly 500 lines of custom lemmas and proofs, 200 lines of tactics driving the compiler, 400 lines of verified assembly, and 300 lines of calling convention specifications. The total derivation takes 20 minutes, with about 15 minutes spent in the stage handled by previous work, and five minutes spent in the new extraction phase. Benchmarking this kind of stuff is always a bit fraught, because it's not always clear what you should be measuring against. The compiler we use to the last levels of a stack, down from our imperative language to assembly, does some optimization, but not that much. So if you directly write assembly for everything, you'll certainly be faster than us. Whereas if, on the other hand, you feed our code to a heavily optimizing but potentially unverified compiler, then we'll be competitive with the equivalent C programs. Maybe a more reliable comparison is to take an in-memory database engine, which provides two things, an interface that we care about, SQL queries, and a bunch of things that we don't care about, like persistence, concurrency, snapshots, and so on. The pitch is that if we did the job well, we should be able to get much better performance because we shed all that bloat that we didn't need while keeping the nice high-level abstraction. And that's basically what the graph says. And depending on the queries, we're anywhere between comparable and two and a half orders of magnitude faster. This isn't surprising, of course, since we're doing a minute fraction of the work that a database engine is doing. But we did do it with the convenience of the same high-level spec <laughs> and proofs, of course. There's a wealth of related work in this array. I've put many representative references on this slide in rough order of decreasing relatedness. I encourage you to check out the paper for detailed discussion Basically, some of the weaknesses that we think we've overcome include generalizing the input language to allow more flexibility in designing the input DSLs, targeting a language with that garbage collection, deriving end-to-end -end proofs, and doing this interactively in the setting that allows you to plug arbitrary verified transformations into your compiler. Thanks all for your attention. To sum up, what we've presented here is a lightweight approach for generating verified extracted code from a shallow embedded language. This is a critical step in the quest to reduce the trusted base of verified systems. 
And we demonstrate this by putting together the first automatic and mechanically certified translation pipeline from declarative specifications to assembly language libraries, supporting user-guided optimizations and parameterization over abstract data types, implemented, compiled, and verified using arbitrary language and tools. We've recently started working on a new iteration of this approach with slightly different source and target languages. Feel free to catch me during the conference to discuss this. Thank you very much. Okay, so we should be back. Um, and are there questions for Clement? See, I don't know, can anyone hear me? Yeah. Yes, we hear you. Oh, good, okay. <laughs> yeah, so if you have a question, you can either do the raise hand or put something in the chat. Oh yeah, okay, there's a uh, question. Now I don't see the hand, wait. Uh, oh yeah, okay, so let me uh, uh, allow it to talk. Hi, so, can you hear me? Uh, yeah. Uh, okay, go hi. ahead. Uh, thanks for the talk. So I had a question related to the program synthesis part. Did you consider or do you think it would be worthwhile to use syntax guided synthesis to synthesize the programs that you were describing? Maybe even using off the shelf side the solvers? Um. So, so in, in a sense, I think the process that we are using is a form of syntax guided synthesis, um, but I hesitate to call it synthesis at all because um, it's so straightforward in the sense to know what you need to do once you're looking at the actual term that um, it, it looks more like compilation than synthesis in the sense that uh, we never backtrack, for example. Um, mm -hmm. In fact, we have a, a set of, um, of uh, lemmas that you feed into the compiler that's so restricted that um, either there's going to be one lemma that applies perfectly to your case, or you're just going to bail out and say, I don't know how to compile this particular structure. Um, in general, we've been resisting adding too many smarts to this part, because um, in a sense, performance is the only thing that the proofs can't guarantee you. So um, whether you get a fast or slow program at the output depends on, on what lemmas you feed in. And so we want the user to be fairly confident that they are feeding in the right lemmas. And so being too smart about which ones we pick uh, would jeopardize that goal slightly. I see. So if, if I may, I, I had a second question that was exactly related to the lemmas. Yes, please. So did you, did you consider using syntax guided synthesis also to generate the lemmas, like as a super optimizer? Um, yeah, I think we're fairly, so um, we didn't do that, but we're fairly agnostic to the way the lemmas are generated. Uh, in the end, as long as they give you a proof about a particular whole triple, and as long as that, that you get, as part of the compilation process, a whole triple that looks like the one you have in your lemma, then you can apply that and through unification make progress on the compilation task. Um, and, and any uh, proof strategy is fair game for establishing those lemmas. I see, thanks. Thank you. Okay, so uh, we're, we're right on schedule, which is good. So Clement, thank you again for the talk.